you, everybody. You're probably sick of the side of my face and I haven't even given my talk yet. So let's, uh, let's focus a bit on, on the science. And I'm going to finish off today and bring us into the tea break by talking a bit about co-crystals, how we model them, how we work with other themes to have meaningful co-crystal predictions. So the message that I want to give you is that our modeling uses a nanoscale lens to look at co-crystals, understand how they behave, what their properties are, and the potential that modeling has to tie into some of the exciting things that Sally was talking about to actually start to crystal engineer these kinds of formulations together. So in terms of what we want to do in terms of integrating density functional theory predictions into both SSPC phase two and FARM five, I'm going to talk to you about the top two today. So investigating molecular interactions and manufacturing processes and tracking properties through co-crystallization. So what we really want to do is we want to have modeling at the start of all of the work that's done in SSPC. Ideally, over the next few years, we'll hopefully start to look at working with the crystal structure prediction that Sally was talking about and feeding that into the predictive models that I'm going to talk to you about today. So we're actually working on those unknown, uncrystallized polymorphs before they even get into the lab, which would be really exciting. So people generally come to us at two points. Either you've grown your crystals and you want to know what their properties are, or you've seen something funny in the lab and you want to know why that is and if we can help you change it. Uh, but generally, it's always working together to improve processes or to improve certain pharmaceutical properties of those materials. So this is our basic co-crystallization ingredients. We have our active pharmaceutical ingredient and our co-former. We want to keep the properties of our drug while improving the properties of how that drug is delivered or how it actually performs when it gets into the body. It can start very basic like this. You might be a PhD student with a set of APIs or a set of co-formers. You've grown your crystals and you want to know what ones you should focus your energy on. Which has the best tabletability? Which has the best bioavailability? What are the actual uh, properties that you want to look at? So we can use our predictions to model certain properties and streamline the work that you're doing as experimentalists so that you can focus on the most exciting candidates. But what we want to move towards is crystal engineering. What are the key design rules that we get out of those small scale studies that can help us to understand what makes a high performance pharmaceutical crystal? So this is density functional theory, as Sally mentioned. What we've done is use DFT to develop a robust, reliable, and quantitatively accurate methodology for studying these. So in the SSPC modeling theme, we actually span this whole range of time and length scales all the way up to Harry's group at the macro scale and the batch processing and the fluid dynamics, down to us who are actually beyond the micro scale, right down at the, the limits of size and time and temperature. So the only limits that we have, the bigger the crystal, the more the computational effort, and depending on the level of theory you use, that's what's going to limit your calculation. So in terms of crystallographers, why should we specifically use DFT? So we know that we use crystals to benchmark molecular structure and properties. But the unit cell is actually where we start with our DFT calculations. So it's a natural avenue within SSPC to link modeling uh, and experiment by using density functional theory. So it's compatible because the models use periodic boundary conditions based on something called Bloch's theorem. So it's an infinite three-dimensional representation of your bulk crystal, which allows us to, just using your unit cell, predict the macroscale bulk properties of your crystals. And as I said, XRD structures, with a small little uh, caveat of good XRD structures and high-resolution XRD structures, um, and we work a lot with experimentalists in terms of actually building the most accurate and physically representative models of what's happening at the nanoscale to, again, have the most realistic uh, validation of what's happening at the macro scale. So what we want to do is eventually look at structure property relationships. I know Ria and Robert are here today from the modeling theme. They should have posters that talk a lot more about this. Uh, but we want to firstly derive our bulk properties. So you can see up there our uh, Young's modulus, our bulk modulus, and our shear modulus. Uh, but as well as bulk properties, we can actually look in detail at the anisotropy of certain properties. So I'm going to talk now about specifically the mechanics of systems and how that relates to tabletability. So if we look across polymorphs, we can actually see huge differences in the anisotropy of the Young's modulus. So not only can we predict that bulk response, but look along individual crystallographic planes to see where those responses are coming from. And we can use known softwares, like I'm highlighting Elate here, which is a great tool for any PhD student working with mechanical properties and elastic stiffness. 
But then we can get down to the fun stuff. We can look at what's actually happening in terms of supermolecular packing to give rise to certain pharmaceutical properties. So we can look at pore structure, we can look at hydrogen bonding uh, patterns, pi pi stacking, uh, so even the way the molecular backbone is orientated at that scale will influence your tablet ability at the macro scale. So we can really break it down with the DFT models and relate those very quantitative values to key unit cell features. So what we do with our DFT, once we've optimized our crystal structure, is we use a method called finite differences, which gives us this elastic stiffness tensor. So if you look at our accuracy, which is what I'm showing on the left, we can predict our bulk properties, which are great, but the real interest and excitement and thing that's going to move us forward in terms of crystal engineering is looking at our individual stiffness tensor components. What's happening in a longitudinal direction? What's happening transversely? What's happening along a shear crystallographic plane to give rise to your properties? And then what we can also do, especially in terms of processing, is we can actually model in silico stress strain curves of crystals. So as you're applying a force to your crystal, be that in something like ball, mil ball milling, mechanochemistry processes, applying any kind of force for tableting, we can actually predict how plastic your crystal is going to be and how it's going to respond to that force. So in terms of trends, this is just a case study here to show how we can track how single API crystals, co-former crystals, and then the, the fully crystallized together co-crystal, how properties track through. And again, that's constantly trying to build up not just what's happening and what the number is, but what's giving rise to that property. We can also look at things like chirality. We've seen a huge influence on the difference between L and D and antiomers, and also racemic crystals. So if you're looking for a very mechanically stable polymorph, generally we always start with our L and antiomers. But for racemic crystals, we see a massive jump in mechanical properties. We've seen Young's modulus values of up to 50 gigapascals, and that's both modeling and experimental. So what we can do is start to build up again our crystal engineering design rules. What co-formers can we use? What space groups do they crystallize in individually? What do the APIs crystallize in? And then build up more and more complex chemistry, more and more complex co-formers to understand very systematically how we can engineer these high performance crystals from the, the nanoscale ground up. So here's an example of how we can relate our packing. As I said, you'll see both your point stiffness and your Young's modulus increase across from your L to your D to your DL at the API level, and then increase even further at the co-crystallization level. So this is showing both what co-crystallization can do for you as a pharmaceutical scientist, but also how closely we can model those before you even go into the lab to carry out these predictions. So you can see how the different packing forms Generally, we use these kind of planar co-former molecules like BPA, BPY, BPE, uh, and we can use that to track properties also outside of mechanical properties. It's just what I'm highlighting today to show you how the self-assembly relates to those structure property uh, relationships. But what we also want to look at is excipients. Excipients are very tricky to model. As we know, they're the third ingredient in our co-crystallization story. They don't crystallize in the unit cell, so we can't study them directly when we're carrying out a DFT calculation on a crystal. And we also need the molecule itself to have certain properties. And what we've developed is to a method for studying simple molecular interactions uh, in order to rationalize what happens with excipients in your large-scale manufacturing processes. So what we use for this is a technique that we can use to actually calculate formation energies or binding energies when we're looking at a crystal. So what we can do is we can break down, we can extract molecular pairs from a crystal and we can quantify the strength of the interactions again along each crystallographic plane. So we can do that for pairs of molecules, we can do it in terms of a formation energy using all of the individual molecular contributions, or for co-crystals we break that down into an API and a co-former contribution. But for excipients, we can actually go back to before the crystals are formed within that mechanochemistry type process, and we can look at what's happening. Is that excipient inhibiting or supporting co-crystal formation when it's introduced with your other molecules? So this was a study that we carried out with Gavin's group to look at THP, which is a drug that's used to treat certain respiratory diseases, uh, to see how that co-crystallizes in the form of certain excipients. And I show this slide a lot because the message that we want to give from the modeling theme is that we're not here to validate what you've already seen in the lab, but to actually understand what's happening at the nanoscale. So this is a fun study where uh, Gavin's group came to us. They had seen an initial stability order uh, in their excipients to give stable co-crystals of THP. And when we ran the models, we actually got a slightly different order. 
which looks something like this, which was showing that PEG was the most stable excipient, and that actually led to them figuring out that there was an error in the actual mechanochemistry that they were doing, and it was actually the experimentalists who were then replicating the model predictions, which was very exciting. And what's nice for us in terms of computational effort and complexity of the calculations is that we can look at very simple uh, co-former API excipient interactions with the very simple message that if your excipient is binding either of these molecules too strongly, when it's introduced into a process, you're not going to get a stable co-crystal. It's literally stealing it away. So it's a very simple story, but it can actually, again, uh, replicate very complex physical manufacturing processes, which is very exciting. So looking forward, what do we want to do? We have very, like I said, highly predictive quantitative models. What do we want to do with them? So what we're doing right now is a case-by-case -case trial and error approach. People come to us with their new set of co-crystals or their new set of APIs. We predict their properties and we see if that can feed into design rules that we've already learned in previous studies. But what we want to do now is we actually want to combine these high throughput, or we want to do high throughput screening very large scale in terms of working with the CCDC, working with crystal structure prediction, to do very large scale screening of optimized ground state structures to give out certain physiochemical properties. So once we've done our high throughput screening, like I said, it's great to have all the numbers, but you want to know what gives rise to the numbers and then how you can use that data to generate knowledge that will help all of us um, in this research center. So we're gonna start with our high throughput screening. We're gonna feed that into our machine learning algorithms and hopefully that will give us out our statistically significant design rules that you guys can then go into the lab and use to engineer high performance crystals and co-crystals. So if you like that, if you want to go a bit more into the details of kind of the DFT that we do, this is a modeling theme uh, led paper that came out last year. You could look into a lot of the stuff that Sally was saying, why we need to incorporate things like quasi-harmonic approximations, different dispersion corrections, and how that can inform uh, how we can have the, the best models that we can with the best predictability, if you want to check that out. Um, but again, a lot, a lot of experimentalists and modelers go into these kinds of large scale uh, collaborations. So to thank everybody in SSPC who's worked with us so far um, and all of our other collaborators to Science Foundation Ireland and ERC uh, for funding our group uh, and for you for listening. So thank you.